David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, January 18th, 2021. We're well into the countdown now. Let's see. It's about, uh, well, let's see, Monday, Tuesday. So about 48 hours from now. I mean, I guess, I, I don't know how we want to count this thing. You want to say there's two days left, three days left? There's really only a half a day, of course, on Wednesday, left of the Trump era, although I have a feeling we'll be living with the era of Trump, or the era including Trump, anyway, for quite some time afterwards. Uh, but uh, I think we've, uh, well, we've pretty much covered it here in terms of about 48 hours from now, I guess Trump will be, I think, he says he's planning to have his military-style send-off out at Joint Base Andrews, I think was what they call it these days, and uh, I don't know what that actually means. I mean, it, it was interesting to hear them term, you know, use that terminology, a military style send off. I mean, a firing squad is a military style fa- stand off. That's uh, or send off. That's not probably not the one he had in mind. Not that it wouldn't be, you know, fitting in one way or another. I mean, he he's into firing squads. There was that uh, brief period of days in which he said he was going to be spending the last days of his administration trying to uh, bring back firing squads as a method of execution for whatever reason. But it's probably not what he had in mind, uh, though he may have had it in mind for other people. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, about, let's see, that that's when he's going to be there. I think he's arranged things such that I guess he's looked ahead and figured out when does he lose control or when does he lose the ability to direct uh, the plane that is usually Air Force One when the president is on board, and I guess it will be while he's flying. I think what usually happens is, of course, the previous president attends the inauguration and then gets a courtesy flight home from the <clears throat> from the new president um, because usually the old outgoing president hasn't fomented an insurrection against the new incoming president uh, just days prior. I mean, you know, there's anomalies. There's always going to be something out at the end of the bell curve somewhere, right? But uh, we've never really made it quite this far. This really does expand the curve quite a bit. Flattens it. He's finally flattened the curve. We have to go way, way out this way just in order to capture him. I mean, I guess we could just put a very long, it wouldn't be a tail, whatever, but up front. Uh, I guess we could put that on the other side of the spectrum and call it a tail instead. Anyway, uh, that's what he's got in mind for himself. And about 48 hours from now, he'll I think that'll be over with because he's arranged for uh, his departure. Of course, he's not attending the inauguration um, and is arranged for his departure such that he will safely land, presumably in Florida, with Air Force One still under his control and still flying as Air Force One because he will still be president at that point. And that's probably what it was all about. He didn't want to be flying on it when it wasn't Air Force One. And I guess, I don't know, if he's smart, he didn't want to give uh, the uh, incoming president, president president-elect now, Biden later will be president, didn't want to give him the opportunity to order the plane to turn around and, and carry him back to wherever. Which, I don't know, I'm not 100% certain that uh, a president couldn't order a plane grounded in American airspace anyway, but, well, we don't really have to get into that. Anyway, apparently, I think he's supposed to be on the ground in Florida before noon on Wednesday is the plan. So, whatever, and then in uh, 48, uh, so three more. 51 hours, I guess, until Biden is president. What's on the schedule for today? Well, for us or for the still current president of the United States? Over here, of course, Bill has put out our morning schedule. And it goes like this. Uh, Well, it's not meant to be a schedule, but we might as well hold it up next to the presidential schedule and see how it compares. The Kegro in the Morning Show is live now. Sorry, kids. Bill says, Kegro X, me, David Waldman, says Trump won't be having infrastructure week this week because it appears that he has uh, run out of weeks. That's true. We're in the 209th week uh, in during which, I guess, was uh, Donald Trump 
will be president, has been president, whatever. Uh, figure that out for yourselves. A uh, short week, of course, Wednesday, it all comes to an end. And if you don't think that's a descriptive enough schedule for a full two hours of discussion, well, take a look at what's happening over at the White House for the current president of the United States. Uh, for about two weeks now, the schedule has read exactly the same, and we've all been amazed by it. Uh, it simply reads, President Trump will work from early in the morning until late in the evening. He will make many calls and have many meetings. And it's not a Curious George book. It's, it's the president's schedule for the day. I, uh, it, I, we could turn it into an early reader book. I like to call it uh, uh, C. Dick Govern. But of course, you know, it's a bit of a lie. He's not governing at this point. Uh, but it's been that way for weeks now. And everybody's been laughing about it. I think I saw a reported early last week that uh, it was revealed at some point. I don't know. Maybe somebody must have asked this question. Who wrote that garbage? And as it turns out, that was dictated directly from the idiot president who thinks that, I guess, is comprehensive and an accurate description of the way he's spending his days. It's not, but uh, I don't know. That's what he wants everybody to think, that he's getting up early in the morning and he's having meetings until late at night, and, and he is having meetings. We'll catch up on what some of those meetings are about. Everyone talked this weekend about the, the, the appearance of the My Pillow guy at the White House, which would be silly enough if he wasn't also carrying plans for another uh, seditious attack on uh, democracy and the physical uh, infrastructure of Washington, D.C. Whoops. Oh, well. Anyway, Greg is here with prob almost no plans for insurrection himself uh, at all, as far as I can tell, but probably some uh, about recapping the one that we already had and previewing another one to come. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Hi. You know, Hi. so it's like uh, Chaos Monday. Yes. And, oh, and uh, I MLK have to say, Day unfortunately, the Trump error will be uh, with us uh, for some time to come. Yes. So it's not so easy to get rid of. Yeah, but in just about 48 hours, he's gone. It is Martin Luther King Day today, so that needs to be acknowledged. Yes. And uh, there's some good stories out there about uh, focusing, for example, on uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King's uh, economic uh, agenda, which uh, often gets forgotten. OK, yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not like uh, everything was sweetness and light and he was beloved at the time. I'm old enough to remember, in fact, that that was, in fact, not the case, not just the way the story ended there. But, uh, uh, you know, vilified by the FBI, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, things change over time. Things get sanitized. Uh, hopefully what happened uh, last week won't get sanitized because treason and sedition is never pretty. It's, so, it's uh, you know, one of the things well, that's uh, uh, coming out now is in addition, uh, interestingly, it's sort of the same number, not just 100 pardons that uh, people are talking about Trump doing in the hours that he has left, but the hundreds of people who have actually been arrested because of the treason and sedition in the Capitol. Uh, one, two of the more interesting ones, I think, this story from the Washington Post, FBI moves on alleged members of extremist groups, oath keepers and three percenters, Oh, those and uh, they're often conflated. Mm -hmm. The three percenters, oh, of course, claim similar. that only three percent resisted the British. Uh, they're a, a much looser, nuttier uh, group. The Oath Keepers are a little bit more organized uh, and claim to recruit from military and uh, 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 law enforcement. Hmm. And in yeah. fact, oh, there are law enforcement the people that wear Oath Keeper badges. So, yeah. you know, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but the fact is, the FBI is, in, is now moving the on these folks. And, and of course, the suspicion has always been that the Justice Department under Trump just looked the other way when it came to these folks because they figured they were Trump voters. Hmm. And, uh, you know, that's gone now. So uh, there's no cover anymore. And uh, this uh, Washington Post uh, story, for example, uh, covers some of the people who, in fact, are being arrested. There's, yeah, there's the guy, the heavy metal uh, uh, guitarist, oh, yeah, John right. Schaefer. Uh, but uh, more importantly, I think uh, Robert uh, Gieswein, G-I-E-S-W-E-I-N, 24, Cripple Creek, Colorado. Huh. Court papers say he's affiliated with an Oath Keepers related extremist group called the Three Percenters, which are two different groups. Huh. And he assaulted federal officers outside the Capitol with bear spray. And a baseball bat encouraged other rioters as they broke a window of the Capitol building, entered, and then charged through the building. 
He runs a private paramilitary training group called the no. Woodland Wild Dogs. And a patch for the group is visible on a tactical vest he wore during the attack on Congress. I highly recommend that if you're going to break into Congress, yeah. please wear your uh, patch in a visible place on your tactical vest right. so we can find you later. That's really a good idea. Put your social security uh, Keith Swain gave a media it. interview in which he echoed anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. The affidavit said and said his message to Congress was they need to get the corrupt politicians out of office. Pelosi, the Clintons, every single one of them, Biden, Kamala. And, uh, you know, that's that's part of the people group, regular folks, your neighbors, but also these folks who also yep. might be regular yep. folks, your neighbors. And also arrested Sunday was Donovan Crowell, 50, former U.S. Marine and Army veteran Jessica Watkins, 38. Now a bartender Watkins recently told the Ohio Capitol Journal that she formed the Ohio State Regular Militia in 2019, a unit of the Oath Keepers. Sure, and that the group has appeared at a dozen protests to protect people. Ah, well, thanks for protecting everybody. That was great. Right? That was great. Good job. Watkins and Crowell were among the 10 individuals recorded at the U.S. Capitol wearing combat helmets, ballistic goggles, tactical vests, Oath Keeper patches who moved in an organized and practiced fashion and oh, forced the way guys. to the front of the crowd. Okay. There was this snake line of yes. uh, people in military gear, you may recall, to lead the siege I and do. break in. Uh, lawyers for the defendants couldn't immediately be identified. And they specifically yeah, hone right. in on Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, and Proud Boys and say they're all uh, significantly or as... Uh, as uh, Mm -hmm. Mitt Romney, uh, you know, might say, you know, they're uh, severely under investigation <laughs> sure, at this particular that. point in time. And so far, the Justice Department has already charged about 100 individuals. Now, there's video all over the place from Parler because uh, when Parler went down, <laughs> taken down by the companies that had supported it, all of their video, uh, incriminating, self-incriminating video was scraped. And then turned over to the FBI. So, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, corresponding evidence that goes with all of this. And, uh, you know, maybe this, uh, you know, people get mad when I call it cosplay. But for some people, it is. For others, mm -hmm. they're they're dead serious about it. Uh, if you do this stuff and then self-aggrandize on uh, social media, which is like 90 percent of the point for some of these folks, it, you're going to get caught. It's not a good idea. And oh. for that matter, Shoot. Uh, you know, the uh, heavy uh, uh, military and law enforcement presence in D.C. Or seems to have completely shut down the January 17th at, at the state capitals as well, uh, because hardly any activity happened, even though there were threats prior to the military yeah, presence quiet. that said there was going to be. So, you know, these guys don't want to commit suicide by army. And so they didn't show up. OK, yeah, there was a, it was much quieter for the weekend than was anticipated. There was lots of promises in the days following. Oats, oats even. Yeah, right. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Well, they only keep 3% of their oats, I think. That's, I, you said people conflate them, and now I can understand why. Uh, but they said they were going to have – they were going to renew all their demonstrations and possibly even their actual insurrections – over the weekend, which is a you know a great time to do an insurrection for if you're if you're a weekend warrior, when are you gonna have your war, right? Weekend. Well, they didn't do yeah. it, uh, and the weekend has passed. And then, uh, of course, there's still the threat out there of of attacks on the twentieth. But uh, right. so far, everybody, law enforcement, private entities, and everybody else in the world is pretty done a pretty good job of making it difficult for them to pull that off so well so you know, far the so famous good. people the q shaman um baked alaska right and now spaz <laughs> spaz, you know, spaz not spaz i wish he hadn't done that since spaz. the attack Proud boys leaders have urged members to pull out a pro-trump protest plan for sunday and around biden's inauguration on wednesday um one of them says he's actually discouraging members from attending planned armed marches next week when Biden's inaugurated, the Proud Boys, he said, are on a, quote, rally freeze mm -hmm. and will not be organizing any events for the next month or so. And, quote, it's unclear how many Proud Boys devotees will abide by that. Some federal law enforcement officials have privately described the group as similar to a nascent street gang that's garnered an unusual degree of national attention in part because Trump mentioned them specifically and others expressed concern that the group may be growing rapidly into something more dangerous and directed. U.S. authorities on Friday arrested Dominique Pezzola, huh. article doesn't say this, but also known as Spaz, 
Well, a I former mean, Marine and Proud Boy member allegedly seen in a widely viewed video shattering a Capitol window with a Capitol Police riot shield and climbing inside. In court papers, the FBI cited a witness who told him the group he was with would have killed anybody they got their hands on, including House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Vice President Pence. I see. It was about uh, 60 seconds away from being spotted by them, as it turns out. Cool. So this stuff was real and it matters and there's going to be consequences and, uh, you know, that's why Trump was impeached and the idea that he can't be impeached yet again for, you know, ridiculous uh, buying of pardons, uh, oh, no, which yeah. was a story in The New York Times from yesterday. Right. Uh, apparently, you know, if you got a million dollars, you can approach associates of Rudy Giuliani. And if you have other people that don't have quite that much but still have a lot of money, you can approach associates who promise you Yes. That it will get considered, and then there's an extra bonus if it actually gets, uh, you know, done. Yeah. So uh, uh, this huh. kind of pardon power is uh, supposedly unlimited, but at the same time, it, it, there's certainly plenty of time to do another article of impeachment if, in fact, he goes ahead and does that. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, lots for- of – yeah, and uh, plenty of uh, debate continuing over the weekend over the question of whether or not uh, former officials can be impeached. Of course, there's an actual answer, but lots of people, I don't know, invested in pretending either that there isn't one or that they can defeat it in See, court. Here's the problem. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm just a very practical person. Hmm. Most right. people agree with us, but a few people insist that the real issue yes. is whether they can. Yeah, when uh, that's a fact, very odd position. To they take. will. Uh, yes, right. That, I mean, it's kind of odd to stick to guns like that when you know you'll find out soon enough uh, it's it's quite obvious <clears throat> you, you can't keep this act up for very long uh but yeah uh, as yeah, for uh challenge it later are completely separate things yeah but the senate I mean, can do whatever the senate wants to do that's that's the real you know that's the basic reality of it and uh but there will be senators who uh take the position that oh well i'm opposed to all of the things that the president did, but I am so concerned about setting a precedent, which is, uh, by the way, just so everybody knows, it's a nonsense position. They'll stick to it anyway. But if you believed that what the president did was wrong, but you were concerned about the precedent, uh, Trump has said as much and everybody has said, oh, well, we'll, we'll sue right away. All right, great. So well, then we'll get an answer. So then you really don't have anything to fear. If you think Trump did something wrong, but you think it's unconstitutional to punish him. The courts are about to rescue you, so just go for it. Do the right thing and uh, figure you the know, courts will too. I read some too. of those uh, uh, What's complaints the and, and uh, concerns and stuff like that, and frankly, it reads something along these lines. Again, I am not a lawyer. I'm just you know reading what I see and trying to interpret it. Mm-hmm. But the short version is you really shouldn't impeach the president because of what it will do to the deficit in the national debt, which we all care about <laughs> as of Wednesday at noon. Well, I, yeah, that's not going to fly either, of course. I it, mean, they're, they're just as well uh, re- uh, reasoned, yeah. and they have just as much standing for that as anything else. True, uh, though the, the argument falls apart pretty quickly. I, I, I'm sure you also saw over the weekend that uh, people were reminding Donald Trump of his insistence, not that he cares, uh, in his first campaign and in his first couple months of governing that he, he he was sure that as a super duper awesome businessman, he would be able to eliminate the federal, I think probably he landed on deficit, although he may have said debt, which would be almost impossible. But he could eliminate the whole thing in the four years <clears throat> in which he Wait, uh, wait, you said deficit when you meant debt. You're yeah. now disqualified from uh, discussing this any further. I can't shoot you with it anyway. I can tell you that. But, yeah, he was going to eliminate the whole thing in four years, and uh, no, he didn't, and it uh, actually increased by an enormous amount and maybe a record-breaking. Well, he's very familiar with balloons and balloon payments. No. Oh, I thought, uh, yeah, yeah, that's probably true. I thought I was envisioning him like balloon animals, like, ooh, I love this when the magicians do these things at birthday parties, but – well, they were trying to use that to entertain him and distract him yeah. in these past few days, but apparently it didn't work. Uh, there is, uh, let's see, one more uh, I- incredible case to describe. The FBI is investigating a claim that a Pennsylvania woman who rioted at the Capitol on January yes. 6th stole a laptop from Speaker Pelosi's office and intended to sell it to the Russians. What? No. Yeah. She appears to have fled 
And uh, there's more about this bizarre case in Politico. Yeah, I'd like to so, see that. So, you know, there's that one. I mean, Got it. there's there's everything. I saw people say yeah, that. Yeah, that these are problem. all your neighbors. Your neighbors are like nuts. But, yeah. you know, there's a whole spectrum of your nutty neighbors, not just one individual neighbor, not just one classification yes. of nutty neighbors. There's the entire spectrum of nutty people that come from regular walks of life and can afford to buy mm. a plane and fly down to oh, right. D.C. and, you sure know, because uh, it's all about uh, economic anxiety. Right. Uh, I will say I did see people speculate on the day, on the 6th, that, you know, what if some of these people that broke in were uh, either foreign agents or uh, whatever, or who either uh, took advantage of it or even inspired the intrusion for the purpose of doing something like this? And, of course, everybody said, oh, please, let's not be crazy. Well, all right. About a week later, it turns out to be true. Right. So uh, this is, I guess, from the official affidavit, if that's what it's called. It appears that uh, this lady uh, has fled, according to local law enforcement officers. Her mother stated that she packed the bag and left her home and told her mother she'd be gone for a couple of weeks. <laughs> she didn't <laughs> provide mom. her mother any Don't information about her intended destination. Sometime after January 6th, she changed her telephone number, deleted what I believe was her social media accounts and Facebook, Instagram, work. Twitter, Reddit, Telegram and Parler. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for which accounts were most uh, associated with uh, insurrection, uh, those are the companies, uh, many of whom oh, have been scrubbing right. people like, oh, for example, Donald Trump, uh, mm-hmm. to pretend that like they had nothing to do with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, as, speaking FBI, of nothing but... to do with it, our two favorite nutcases newly elected to the Congress, uh, Marjorie uh, William, what's her name? Marjorie uh, Taylor. Williams Green. Taylor Green. Marjorie Taylor Green. Right. Uh, had her Twitter account suspended for 12 hours for insisting that there was fraud in the Georgia election. Hurts. And uh, Lauren Boebert appears to be her. under investigation for leading one of those tours yeah. that was seen as a reconnaissance tour. And uh, she keeps getting fingered by people who were eyewitnesses that said, yep, she did that. Uh, she's very distinctive. She's very tiny. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I have a feeling that people who think they saw her are probably right. Well, you know, one uh, Democratic congressman complained about people doing this. And so Borbert responded, how dare you call me one of these insurrect? And he said, I didn't name anybody. It was like right out of a Perry Mason, you know. (laughs) Right. I didn't say anybody's name. I thought you did. How did you know it was gloves (laughs) that we found? Uh At the scene. We didn't say that. All we said is we found something at the scene. Well, those aren't my gloves. How did you know they were gloves? Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Good luck with this one, Lauren. Oh, hey. Get her. Abby. Yeah, I agree. I would want to do the same thing. Uh, Lauren Bobert just showed up at your house uh, in the guise of delivering a package. So, all right. Not a big problem. I am uh, interested in checking in on the, this uh, Politico story at some point later. And by the way, as far as... Um, uh, the, I know you mentioned also the snake line of experienced uh, ex-military making their way through the crowd. That also gets a mention and a call out in a segment that uh, our good friend Darwin Darko has sent in, making uh, that and other observations about the involvement of military or military adjacent folks in not only the the uh, activities of the six, but now apparently everyone has specific worries about their participation in events on the 20th from the other side. We've got a lot of discussion about that as well. A lot of uh, stories that we can share with you about uh, worry has reached the command level that, uh, hey, a lot of these, as Greg mentioned, a lot of these Q nuts are your your neighbors and otherwise uh, part of your daily life and routine. And a lot of those folks also serve in the National Guard units that may have been called up to provide security in the Capitol between the 6th and inauguration on the 20th. So apparently now uh, military brass thinking about how can we do a quick review of our troops to make sure that we haven't placed one of these idiots on the wrong side of the fence line. So we'll check. So, uh, you know, in the minute or so we have before the break, Mm -hmm. uh, I have to also point out to people who are uh, otherwise not aware, Axios is doing a series right now called yes. Off the Rails right. Behind Trump's Post-Election Meltdown. They're up to episode four. 
Yeah, I read one through three yesterday. One through three was pretty interesting. Four is more of a, a, a Bill Barr uh, leak to this to make himself look good. It's called mm. Trump Turns on Barr. Ah. But uh, the first one, I think, is perhaps the most significant one. It's called A Premeditated Lie Lit the Fire and just goes through in ex- excruciating detail how Trump attempted to set up the red mirage wherein ah, yes, right. he'd be leading in votes as uh, election eve uh, came to a close and then he was going to declare himself the victor and it was completely spoiled by the fox news call that uh, arizona went to biden yeah and trump flipped out and started calling and and delegating calls to everybody he knew at fox to say what the hell is going on how could you do this to me right Undo and it, so like it's pretty interesting but you know the point is it didn't just sort of happen it was a plan it was a it, it was a cunning plan, as Baldrick might say, to, uh, uh, you know, to to uh, to who? To I, I don't know. <laughs> to Blackadder. <laughs> you got me. That's the who. Yeah, got it's me. The Blackadder now. series, uh, which is brilliant uh, if you haven't oh, yes. seen okay, it. Okay, thank you. I know. I know where we Goes are. Goes down there with yes, minister is like if you're in politics, those are oh. two things you just have to see. Uh, but uh, this cunning plan fell apart. And Trump just lost it. And, uh, you know, the story of how that went down is actually pretty amazing reading. Yeah, it was. Uh, I found it pretty interesting myself. And uh, it was very revealing. I mean, I don't know how well the reporting stands up. I have no reason to challenge it, though. And it, it's it's the worst possible sort of setup for Trump in that uh, it is clear that he is made aware ahead of time, as we all were, that this red mirage was likely to occur and was and he said great i can use this right and he was also fully aware and made fully aware and understood indicated that he understood why that would happen and how that would make sense but he said i'm going to distort it anyway and use it as a launching pad for what ends up in this insurrection so uh pretty damning really and we'll be back to damn it one more time in two minutes I'll probably damn it now, though. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for K-Grow in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the K-Grow in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that K-Grow in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday, but our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to Patreon.com slash KGROX to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue uh, damning uh, Donald Trump and all that he stands for. Greg's still right. here. And, and just, Let's you know, to, to get a flavor of, again, how things collapse after you're no longer president and everybody suddenly finds a backbone and uh, suddenly realizes that there is a set of laws to follow and a constitution to pay attention to. This one's from the Daily Mail in the UK. Manhattan DA expands criminal investigation into Trump Organization finances. And this particular story especially involves Eric, but it's about uh, looking at their compound Seven Springs in Westchester in uh, uh, Bedford Hills, and, and essentially how they pump up the uh, price of things, uh, which is uh, potentially tax fraud. And this is yet another different uh, twist on basically the same practice that the, they, the real estate company, do all the time, which is why everybody from New York who knows them thought that they were the lowest of the low. If you're the bottom feeders in the real estate industry, mm, yuck. this is low. Yeah. <laughs> really low. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, all of a sudden... Uh, These things are happening. Manhattan DA is investigating Trump for possible tax fraud, bank and insurance fraud. Vance was already investigating hush money payments, but the investigation now includes Trump's home at Seven Springs, a historic estate in Westchester, New York, purchased in 1996 for $7.5 million, 
which of course the Trump uh, organization oh, no, now strength. values it at 291 million. Oh yeah, because right. Well, why not? Because sure. that's what you do. Um, so they take time. charitable tax deductions for not developing it. Oh, they wanted to build a golf course, even though they signed an agreement that they wouldn't develop the place. Uh, in 2014, Eric Trump described it as the family's personal compound where he'd spent summers as a child learning the art of the deal and uh, <laughs> how to play the violin. And, you know, which is good because mm. he's probably got the smallest, saddest one ready to play when yeah. he gets busted for this. Cool. All right. So, you know, just all of Can a sudden these guys are coming to the realization because they're not very smart that not only do they owe a lot of money, but uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and the uh, UAE and all the other foreign uh, uh, dollars that flow into their organization may kind of dry up. And by the way, they're liable for it as of Wednesday at 12.01. And, hmm. uh, you know, that's not sitting too well. I don't know if any of them are really sleeping well at this particular point in time. And, you know, I'm over it. Okay. Well, how are you sleeping? I'm sleeping just Pretty fine. Pretty good. Knowing that they're not. Okay. Well, yeah. Sure. Why not? Right. What else do we have here? We have, uh, after Twitter banned Trump, a 73% plunge in election misinformation spread on the Internet in just one week, <laughs> according to Washington Post. Fascinating analysis of how swiftly the president and his allies were able to amplify falsehoods. We were yelling at them. In fact, Kamala Harris said very early on in the uh, primary process, get Trump off Twitter. She was right, as she often is, about a whole lot of stuff. Uh, and I think that was important. Chris yeah. Polanski sends me this hmm. piece from uh, Nebraska. A pastor I know in small town Nebraska has had her column in the local paper canceled Aww. for submitting the following, which the editor refused to publish. It's a scriptural take on what happened at the Capitol. And uh, he thinks it's very much worth reading. Okay, so I'll send right. that to you. We don't have to read that whole thing. But the point is, Maybe she basically anyway. said to her flock, you know, a lot of things went wrong here. And perhaps we ought to look inward and repent a little bit about where we went with this and why we did. Hmm. And that got her fired. Oh, well. Because it's just so subversive to say uh, something like that. It's the title of the article right. is called It's Time to Repent. My column for the Elgin Review was rejected this week by the paper. In fact, the opportunity to continue writing a column has been revoked. Oh dear. The editor wrote saying, Rebecca, first, let me say thank you for your past column submissions. We've made a decision this week to go in a different direction. <laughs> a lie. Very As true. a result, we'll no longer be publishing your column. Sincerely, Dennis Morgan, owner and publisher. And basically, uh, she said, there's nothing of Jesus in what took place at the U.S. Capitol on Epiphany. Uh, yeah. Well, not really. I mean, he, they said his name a lot, but he wasn't there. Not by might and not by power, but by spirit, says the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4.6. Jesus was not part of the mob last Wednesday. Jesus' love is law. Jesus' gospel is peace. Saying that got her booted. Hmm. That's a weird one to get booted on. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> you have to appreciate the fact that uh, this whole insurrection is wrapped up in not just white supremacism, but yes. trying to use uh, Christianity as a uh, as a barrier, as a shield uh, mm -hmm. for what they're doing, uh, which, of course, you know, everybody and anybody who remembers what actually happened during the Civil War is not surprised That's because uh, it was used then as well. You know, we we have to. It's, we you know, used it's a lot. God's rule. We have to do this. Uh, yeah. Usually, uh, whenever a war comes around, you, whoever it is, us, them, yeah, God's on our side. Okay, well, that's a, that is standard so fare a lot warfare, to be written but by there's a lot know here. A lot more about it than I do, but uh, you know, pretty significant, I think. A and, major, uh, you know, there's a reckoning team. that's going to happen uh, in terms of looking back and saying, how did we get here? Whether it's the phonies and grifters like Franklin Graham, mm -hmm. uh, or the actual, you know, uh, folks who take this seriously, like the lady who wrote that column. Yeah. Uh, well, it's going to be an interesting angle on the inquiry, and it's a developing uh, thesis on what happened there that's, uh, that has actually been developing you know, since the beginning, but in a parallel uh, analysis track. Um, I, I, Peter Manso, who uh, is a uh, – what does he write for? Uh, well, several places, of course, but he's been uh, in – 
uh, I think in New Yorker and now I think writes chiefly for the Smithsonian, uh, but a very interesting perspective on things and a uh, sort of a historian of religious movements in America has been insisting from the beginning of, of our analysis of the insurrection that you're missing the, uh, you know, Christian dominionist stripe that runs through this whole thing. And it's actually going to end up being a big factor, a much bigger factor in it than you probably think. And uh, he's been demonstrating the rightness of that case for a week now. And others coming around to the same conclusion. Others who were fellow travelers who began on the same point right along with him, of course. But uh, you know, they tend not to just blurt those things out without evidence to support it. Uh, but I think we'll all begin absorbing that lesson in the next week or so as well. Good, good yeah. work. On his behalf. Uh, speaking of good work, Rudy Giuliani tells ABC News he will not be part of Trump's impeachment team. Uh, uh, because I gave uh, an earlier speech at the January 6th rally before the Capitol riot, I am a witness <laughs> and therefore unable to participate in court or Senate chamber, he yeah, said. you're a suspect. Which I don't think that's are. necessarily true because it's not like a court the way court rules have courts. <laughs> but the problem is yeah. he gave a terrible interview to John Carl and nobody <laughs> on Trump's team wants him. <laughs> Uh, there are many reasons not to want him as your representation anywhere. Uh, I guess chief among them, you will lose because he's terrible. But yes, also oh, that's the main he's reason, a but suspect and a witness. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the rule is in impeachment because you can kind of do anything. But uh, yeah, they, to the extent they try to emulate a uh, trial situation because it's a, 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 a rubric that many – members of Congress are familiar with. Yeah, you try not to have people who are witnesses uh, appear as counsel in these things. And, uh, well, whatever. He was well, going to get does, fired. Does that anyway. mean they were going to subpoena him? Uh, yeah, it could certainly happen. He's not a witness yet because he hasn't been subpoenaed, as far as I know. That but, we know. Yeah, now but he's... He may know because he said something. Yeah, this is a better... Uh, last time it was true too, but they didn't end up subpoenaing because they couldn't subpoena any witnesses. So he was able to, to skate on that, although he never really argued as counsel on the floor anyway. Um, this time around, uh, it just sounds better that you're going to be a witness. What's really the case here is that uh, he's he's a, a suspect in a criminal investigation into what happened as well so well you know clyde haberman asked the even better question no. i won't ask this every day but it deserves oh, to be right. repeatedly on the agenda why has rudy giuliani not been charged with inciting the mob on january 6th uh, right uh, Pro prosecution is warranted forget about being a witness right yeah no he would be a witness in the <clears throat> maybe in the impeachment trial i mean he might have a role to play in some criminal trials as a witness but yeah he'll be there as, as on his own as a defendant at some point too uh, it's absolutely the case, but he can't say as much, so he's going to say witness instead. So, all right, <clears throat> it's a nice dodge, but a lot of discussion of our, how horrible his record has been as an attorney in the last couple of years, decades. Uh, yeah, and uh, a lot of discussion of that in that Axios series, probably in I don't know, install whether it's installment two or three, but discussion of just how bad the P what has become the Trump legal team really is. And in part three, as I recall, how clear Trump was in his understanding that that was the case, but he didn't care. <laughs> and then eventually uh, staff around him could no longer tell whether he was simply exploiting their craziness or had come to believe it himself. It's always the problem with him. So lots to... Uh, dive into in the Axios uh, series, although uh, as revealing as it is, there's also part of me and maybe part of you too when you read it that will be like, why didn't, Ac why didn't Axios and their very influential gang of writers do this earlier or say, well, we knew he was an crazy. To that. Jonathan Swan, when he wrote about this, said, this reporting comes from people who were in the room. Ah. So the presumption is they weren't talking until now. All right, I guess so. Like and Jonathan I mean, Swan, Swan was in did. the room when he did this. He had to have people who were in the room tell him. Yeah. And they weren't ready to tell him two weeks uh, ago. That is probably a good explanation for these particular things. And Jonathan Swan did. He, it was his uh, 
interview on video not that long ago that was one of the better pushbacks on uh, virus denialism with with Trump too, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it was. So, so uh, not, you're referring to episode three, which is called "Descent into Madness." Yes. Maybe or Trump. The, the subheader Trump says sometimes you need a little crazy, and it's the story mm. about how when his regular sane counsel started to tell him he lost, and there's really not much he could do about it, yes. he started tuning them out and turning to Rudy and to uh, Jenna Ellis. Sydney and uh, Sidney Powell and other crazy people. And in fact, uh, Sidney Powell was so crazy. Trump, according to this story, liked to put her on speakerphone with the mute button and listen to her rant and then tell people around him how nuts she was. This yeah. is really amusing. But I'm and then use every this. once in a while, turn on the, the non mute button and say, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, go good. And Sydney, then keep mute going. it again and say, look, she's nuts. She's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Uh, all with the idea of, well, you know, she's crazy. I don't really believe this, but I think that there are people who will, and I'm going to use that. But then, yeah, sort of as it as it finishes up and then sets up episode four, uh, the atmosphere changes a little bit, and and people around Trump are saying, "What happened? He used to, I mean, it was cynical and horrible that it, what he was doing with Sidney Powell, but by the end, he seems to have said, you know what? Maybe that is right, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna start believing that instead." Yeah. Wow. So here's here's uh, one anecdote from that series uh, about meeting with Mitch McConnell. Yes. OK. QAnon enthusiast Lauren Boebert had won the Republican primary for Colorado's third congressional district. Mm. Consensus in the room was that Boebert's victory was a stunner. The president then said to McConnell, you know, she's a believer in QAnon. Are you familiar with that, Mitch? And McConnell <laughs> sat there stone faced. He didn't move a muscle. Mm -hmm. You know, people say they're into all kinds of bad things and say all kinds of terrible things. But, you know, my understanding is they basically are just people who want good government. <laughs> That's a way and, of putting it. And the it. room fell silent. Nobody knew how to respond. And Mark Meadows burst out laughing. Yeah. I've heard them described a lot of ways, but never quite like that. Right. Everybody laughed. And then Swan adds, in terror quite candidly, oh. says a source in the room. Yeah. Uh, and, and here she amazing. is in Congress. And potentially, uh, she's got some legal trouble ahead of her. Yeah. Well, she's, uh, she's going to go through some too. things, I guess I should properly say. <laughs> right. Uh, not traffic problems. So, yeah. Uh, well, all right. Her uh, nomination, along with the Greens, uh, triggered a lot of discussion here on the show and in my own Twitter feed. You know, it's, since September, I've kind of been adamant that the two of them are essentially. Uh, uh, a, a you know a part of an a, assassination team that gets to put on the the fancy dress and a member's pin and show up and escort uh, shooters and zip tie guys in the door without questions and it was an extremely dangerous thing to do to seat them as though they were legitimate people who deserved seats in congress it was very difficult it would cause legal problems etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, you ought to take these things seriously, just as you ought to have taken seriously the possibility that somebody was going to sell that laptop to the Russians. Uh, P.S. Note from listeners uh, here. Karen says the uh, latest info is that uh, Russia laptop lady has, in fact, been arrested. So that's oh, good. she has. They got her. Uh, yeah. Although with the uh, laptop or is that already on the way to my, I don't know that I'm not sure of. And I've seen this picture before. I know her picture was being circulated over the weekend and I thought they were having difficulty finding her and arresting her. But the, over the weekend, I never saw this woman. Uh, I didn't see her matched with the laptop, but I guess at least some of the reports say, yeah, yeah this was, uh, I had seen her as the, uh, mentioned as a woman spotted on, videos the various videos that people took directing people inside the capitol up the stairs and telling people how they could find nancy pelosi's office from where they were um and i don't think that they put the laptop thing on her over the weekend that i saw but maybe they've matched it and uh she's also missing from her home and not told her mother where she's going to be for two weeks or whatever uh yeah i didn't know about the laptop thing i i also, I did see initial claims about the laptop being stolen, probably on the 6th or 7th. Um, and then there was some pushback, and I don't know whether it was uh, whether it's true or just trying to keep a lid on things. But people were saying, well, that was a laptop that's got nothing on it. It's used for slide presentations, 
when we project slide presentations in the office, which would be great if true, but, uh, you know, might not turn out to be the case. Or, or it would be very funny if they sold that to the Russians and the Russians said, this is garbage. We want our rubles back. So we'll see. But, uh, yeah, this, uh, hmm, 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 where is it? Riley Williams, apparently, is her name. And uh, we get to shout it out now because she's been arrested. And then uh, if she's cleared later, we say, gosh, it's a big mistake. Sorry, Riley. But for now, you're a traitor. <laughs> anyway, okay. uh, that uh, kind of summarizes the the uh, mess of what was going on. We should point out, you know, for the record, mm -hmm. uh, Americans, for the most part, reject the rioting. Uh, right. Trump's uh, approval numbers are in the gutter. Uh, yes. They're as low as they've ever been. And a pretty dramatic drop at that, if you look at the graphs and charts. Um, and uh, even Joe Manchin uh, is uh, amenable to removing uh, mm, yes. Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz with 14th Amendment. He says mm. it should be a consideration, not just Boebert and Green. And, uh, and Mo Brooks, I think, is also mm. at risk, by the way, sure, wow. uh, for a lot of his incendiary comments prior to the riots. So things yeah. are happening and people are pretty serious. And I think having your life threatened by uh, what is every day a clear indication that, in fact, mm. those are uh, real life threats to your uh, real life. Yeah. And uh, that does focus your uh, attention a little bit. And I think that uh, the Congress is going to wind up taking this seriously. And how important was that uh, win in Georgia for the Democrats that they could even consider doing stuff like this? Yes. That's true. Uh, I'm surprised to see Manchin uh, out there on this one. Uh, the big question, of course, what happens if somebody tries to filibuster the uh, <laughs> the motion to expel these people? Well, you know, I what can I do? I want to vote to expel them, and I think we should, but gosh, I just can't support. Uh, you're, you're trying to radicalize me, says Joe Manchin on the filibuster, which, as you know, I completely oppose. But if it's my own motion that you're trying to filibuster, I may change my mind. Yeah, that could work. Of course, if you're able to uh, break a filibuster on it, that you're pretty close to getting to that ex expulsion vote threshold, too. That reminds me, though, Mo Brooks. Um, I've been thinking a little bit about the fact that, of course, you know, they were there to uh, lots of people in the Capitol on the 6th with the intention of killing members of Congress that uh, you'd think would be more sensitive to this. Like, for instance, I, I keep thinking of Steve Scalise, who was, of mm -hmm. course, shot in that attack at the baseball, congressional baseball game practice session. And yep. uh, since then, I have been, you know, I don't think it was a surprise to anybody, but I've been extraordinarily disappointed in how little use he's made of his second chance at life. Uh, all the movies tell you you become a better person after that, but apparently not the case for Steve. I mean, it may have happened. Marginally better than what Steve Scalise was before uh, leaves a lot of room. So I can't be certain, but he hasn't been a, a standout in uh, the redemption ranks here. But I, I, I was reminded, as you were saying it, wasn't Mo Brooks also there and very prominently involved in telling the story of uh, what a hero uh, maybe that he was and by, I think, uh, telling Steve Scalise, I'll pray for you, uh, but whatever. And I think he tried to help uh, cover him up and get him evacuated and uh, even had some muted praise, I think, for the uh, Capitol Police and other staffers who helped save Scalise's life. Well, but, your uh, memory is correct. In fact, I'll send you the article. Okay. But I, I can't recall whether he thought he had done something heroic himself there or uh, or what. But he, he was a, I don't know. He, was he, very he removed his belt to provide a tourniquet ah, for Zach okay. Barth, the congressional aide who was shot in the leg, and also helped attend to Scalise, who was shot in the hip. Okay. Yeah, all right. So, so he, he acted bravely in the face of a shooter mm -hmm. and uh, and did, in fact, help that day. And so the U.S. Capitol Police gave him a merit, uh, medal of merit. Mm. Yeah, okay. So All right. so he's entitled to brag about that. Yes, I guess that's good. Um, and and then he said, you know, I, I guess I like that whole situation so much. Why don't we have another one here at the Capitol? Except this one, I'll invite them myself. And uh, this time, because I'm inviting them, I know I'm not in any danger. And, and, and that's much more comfortable for me. I don't know. Anyway, too was bad. He, was he in the Capitol? Uh, Mo Brooks. 
Uh, yeah, I understand. Yes, uh, he he was there, ready to object to the electoral votes uh, from the various mm-hmm. states. He was the first member of Congress to say that he would register such an objection. So he was on hand to do that. But he also apparently had an organizational hand in putting together the the rally that led to this. And 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 that too, uh, another major development over the weekend, uh, reporting on just how uh, how prominent a role many members of the es- Republican establishment who are now aghast at what happened had in organizing that rally and putting the president on stage to then foment the insurrection. Well, not just responsible, but they've been scrubbing their websites and yes. getting rid of their and social media and now front. pretending they had nothing to do with it, mm-hmm. which, of course, uh, doesn't look at all guilty. No. And a lot of them are, uh, you would think, would know better. I don't know what else you're going to do, but try and scrub things. But, uh, you know, they knew how they could be held accountable even as, and how it would make it worse to scrub things because a lot of them were attorneys general themselves in their states. Apparently the Republican Association of a State Attorneys General were was prominently the leadership of it, prominently involved in in promoting organizing and promoting this rally and I yeah, think, I think their executive Bill Barr director's well. already out for that after yeah. denying it and then, you know, you, you so, can't stay with stuff like that. Uh no. So uh Care SF uh, sent uh, to KITM, yeah. of course, that's Kegro in the morning, the uh, arrested 22-year-old yeah, Riley June is. Williams, now in jail, after her ex-boyfriend spotted her in news video from inside the Capitol and called the FBI tip line, hmm. and now being investigated for stealing Nancy Pelosi's laptop. So somebody saw that and wrote in and says, what's KITM? Oh, yeah. And Kara SF said, well, KITM is a talk radio show done by Kegra X, David Waldman. Yeah. Once part of Daily Coast, now independent, good political commentary with great guests. Hey. And Dem from Connecticut. So I'm not one of those great guests. Oh. I just happen to be there. <laughs> great guests, but also great. <laughs> I read that and, and I'm still laughing. I think that's just okay. perfect. I think she that is it. like chef's kiss. <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, yeah. All right. There's well, some also, fantastic the people there. He's there, too. <laughs> that's not what she meant. I know, but it's I what know. she it's, said. It's funny. Yeah. You got to uh, laugh given is. the fact that our is country a... almost collapsed and, you know, insurrection right. was well, uh, not to the point where it's going to succeed, but to the point where it could have really, really hurt people. And in fact, did. Uh, uh, yes. You know, uh, it could have uh, hurt a lot more. Dead and and uh, could have been a lot worse. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see this. Uh, <clears throat> I guess there's a link probably in the tweet that she sent us. But I definitely saw this woman. And identified as being as having been the person who was directing people to Pelosi's office, which I guess she knew where it was for various reasons, up to and including having just been there and stolen a laptop from it. Uh, but yeah, it'll become clear, I suppose, whether she had been there, stole the laptop, and then directed others, or had uh, you know, was there for that purpose. But I definitely saw people discussing on the sixth. Before the day was over, and I think I tweeted on the 8th when the subject came up again, that I had definitely seen people talking on the 6th. Like, there were some people who broke in who went looking for members, but there were definitely some people who also ran to very weird and obscure offices that might have been suspected to have held some sensitive information and made off with that stuff and didn't stick around necessarily uh, parading or uh, uh, streaming their video, but made a beeline for sensitive stuff and then were out the door. So big questions. Well, here, here's an example woman. of uh, questions. This is from CNN Politics. Okay. Army reservist with security levels, security clearance mm-hmm. among the latest charge in connection with Capitol Riot. He had yeah. secret level security clearance, not security level, secret level security clearance and a long record of posting his extremist views online. He's among the latest wave of rioters charged by federal prosecutors. Mm. So if you have secret level security clearance, but you're an extremist, why do you still have secret level security clearance? And the answer is because it's the Trump administration, but that's about to change as of January 6th. That's true. And then sometimes people just slip through or whatever. But yeah, if it's your project to let people have that. Well, I think if you step back and look at the big picture of all the different anecdotes we've been doing, you know, the message that comes across here is that uh, DH not DHS, yeah, Department yeah, of Homeland Security, sure. not HHS, but DHS and the FBI and the various and sundry agencies who were mm-hmm. tasked with protecting the Capitol. But 
also uh, law enforcement in general, simply did not wish to consider uh, right wing groups who, in fact, are Trump supporters yes. as a threat because either they didn't want to tick off the boss mm. or because they themselves didn't see it mm. or because they themselves are it. Mm. But for whatever reason, they refuse to take right wing extremism seriously. Yeah. That's been true for a decade. We know that going back to the Obama administration. We talked about that, I think, on the last show in terms of how uh, yes. reports about watching right wing extremism were scrubbed and, and uh, protested by Republicans. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, that's what's going on here. And things are going to change radically uh, yeah, on uh, on January 20th uh, at noon. I hope so. Uh, I guess one other factor in all of that is, of course, uh, just sort of this general and still lingering and pervasive uh, problem of law enforcement, even if they're ostensibly uh, OK guys and on the right side and offended by the idea of Trump permitting a lot of this still just sort of like, well, white people don't get involved in things that are really, really terrible. So we'll just investigate it from the perspective of it being an innocent mistake of some kind. Yeah, it's, it's a public relations yeah. problem. We'll give it to our PR right. department. <sighs> right. So uh, it's not clear. Let's see. Oh, Lisa Eisenhart, you know her. She's the mother of Eric Munchell, zip tie guy number one. Oh, what do you mean? I know? And okay. she was arrested. Yes. Uh, uh, because uh, she's charged with breaking into the Capitol and disorderly conduct. And she according to the charging document, she's seen on video footage holding flex cuffs as she mm. chases police officers as part of the mob. Chases police So remember, officers. if you're going oh, yeah. to you forgot commit your insurrection, bring your mom <laughs> and uh, you know stop for milk and cookies in the middle of all of this because it's important. Right. Everybody gets Dairy Queen at the end like a Little League game. So it's important. Bring your mom. She has to drive back and forth. Uh, a surprising number of moms brought to this protest. I really don't know why that happens. Or a lot of moms involved in watching their kids being arrested afterwards, too. Uh, yeah, Facebook has a lot to do at home. for. Take care. Okay. And, thank uh, you. We'll you too. see if it's going to be as chaotic on Wednesday. Uh, uh, but yeah. hopefully the show of force will cool things down. Right. Well, one more Trump uh, era show on Wednesday. We'll see you then. Thanks. All right. Welcome back now to the Gay Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. So much to try and cram in here. So little time. Uh, and definitely something I want to do is uh, intro what I got from our friend Darwin here. Because uh, one, it'll give me a long time to take a break if I want to. But Because uh, I've already heard the segment. But uh, you won't want to take a break at this point because you'll want to hear what he has to say. Uh, as Greg mentioned uh, at the end of the segment, he had this piece from CNN Army Reservist, right? With secret, uh, with security level, is it, well, uh, I think they meant secret level, but it says here in the headline, security level, security clearance. That doesn't make any goddamn sense. But all right, I think you know what they meant. But uh, that was a big deal over the weekend, um, both from people who do legitimately have some kind of clearance to be on the wrong side of the fence line on Wednesday, and some stories about people who uh, don't have the right to be on the other side of the fence line, but we're trying to get there anyway uh, through hook or by hook or by crook, you might say. Uh, okay, first, this piece here, Army Reservist. Federal investigators say a secret level security clearance and a long record of posting his extremist views online, which I really thought that the government was better at finding out about. But uh, we now know that uh, people have been posting online extremist views online for a long time. And it really the FBI finds them very quickly after you've blown something up or, you know, or they've planted a, a, a spy there to check you out. And they find you just moments before it's too late. But generally speaking, uh, social media, I don't know, they seem to not do a very good job at figuring this stuff out ahead of time. Although they also have algorithms that allow uh, wandering bands of, well, very frequently wandering bands of Nazis to get other people banned for saying things that actually aren't too bad. That, uh, actually, that too, a good point that, that I want to get to at some point. <clears throat> uh, but I, I, I can't go searching for it right now because I want to get up to what Darwin sent, but I, I do want to make this point anyway. Somebody made the very great observation and I put their tweet away and it deserves a much broader discussion 
Uh, so I'll just put the marker down here just saying, are we going to really glide past this whole thing now that we're like uh, uh, talking about how social media needs to clean up its act, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to glide past the, the fact that the wrong side in all of this, the Nazis and extremists, have been extremely effective in getting people banned for their speech for either permanently or for – uh, times certain as penalties by pressuring the social media companies to get rid of them. And they're just ordinary people who aren't necessarily involved in any uh, mass movement or any uh, uh, plots to, to do anything in particular. They just are expressing their views in ways that annoy organized uh, right wing, whether they're full blown Nazis or, or anything else. And they, have a system whereby they mass and mass report to the companies that what somebody says is in violation of various policies, either that it's hate speech or that it threatens violence when it's usually in many cases, something that is a very obvious misinterpretation of, in some cases, the use of uh, idiomatic expressions that we all understand to be something other than genuine threat. And, you know, it's important because, of course, the interpretation of language is going to be a big part of figuring out whether there's a criminal case against anybody who spoke at the rally or who uh, actually broke into the Capitol, et cetera, et cetera. But a great point that uh, social media has been very adept for years at banning people when they want to for their speech, although they've been doing it completely wrong and on behalf of the right wing. And that can't really be uh, elided in a comprehensive review of what went wrong here, but it will be probably left out of the law enforcement review of what went on on the 6th and, and leading up to it. <clears throat> anyway, as I mentioned, uh, lots of discussion of fear of people being on the wrong side of the fence line reported over the weekend. Uh, also, again, on the weekend, two people I know that I know of arrested in two different incidents by police now, you know, and other authorities providing security in Washington, D.C., um, in incidents in which there was disputes over the validity of the credentials they claimed allowed them to pass into the secure zone. The first one Still a little bit up in the air in terms of what exactly was going on, but a guy who claimed to have been hired through a private security agency to uh, provide additional security inside what is now actually being described by the military as a green zone here in Washington, D.C., which is a bad place to be. Um, but then it turns out that he might actually maybe have had a legitimate story, and we'll see how that one sorts itself out. We'll discuss it in the days to come, perhaps. If that one developed, and then one outright wacko who is just apparently like presented a challenge coin at some checkpoint and said that that I don't know was some sort of magical medallion that was supposed to allow her in to the secure area, and that one I think a much more clear cut case. But also on top of it all, reports I think originating in the Associated Press, FBI vetting guard troops in D.C. amid fears of insider attack. Uh, Politico later picking up the same story, fearing inside attack, FBI vetting guard troops in D.C. That, uh, you know, might be too late to do that effectively. <clears throat> but uh, good to know that they have that on their radar anyway. Uh, at this point, I think what I'll do is, uh, yeah, what's the best way to actually open this thing up and play it? I think we might have to go into... Uh, I, I, it's a longer file from... Uh, Darwin here, and I don't think I can make it work through soundboard, so I might just have to open it up this way and play it through our uh, one of our other applications. But Darwin, uh, as you know, uh, really has been kind of our uh, informal or unofficial military reporter of sorts. I mean, obviously, that's going to be of personal interest to him, and he's covered a lot of other things as well, but a lot of military uh, stories or military related stories catch his eye. This one did too. And this, he had finished recording and sent to me before this story about the FBI vetting guard troops. But clearly that would be, I think the next step 
if they had, if I had been able to play this thing on Friday, they would have been able to say, I heard on KITM that we ought to be vetting our troops. Uh, he sent along, let's see, how many uh, of these articles? I've got at least two or three of these articles from the Military Times, Stars and Stripes. He calls them all out, uh, discussing the obvious participation in the insurrection and the riot, the sacking of the Capitol by people who clearly have at least some military experience. They weren't all necessarily just military wannabes. And uh, as you can imagine, he's quite incensed about it. And it comes through. Let's roll it. Hey there, David. Thanks for squeezing me in. I have several things that I want to run through here. And it's all to build the case that I want to get to towards the end, sort of a uh, crescendo. Uh, We can jump in first and foremost here with uh, Stars and Stripes. I provided articles before by this uh, writer here, this reporter, Corey Dickstein. uh, And he wrote this on the 14th, so just yesterday. And it's entitled Virginia Army National Guardsmen Charged in U.S. Capitol Riot. And it pictures a couple of these guys here. Uh, They must have taken a selfie uh, while they were inside the Capitol there. So he begins, a Virginia Army National Guard soldier faces federal charges for participating in the siege late last week of the Capitol building that briefly delayed Congress from certifying President-elect Joe Biden's election victory, Defense and Justice Department officials said on Thursday. Jacob Fracker, a corporal in the Virginia Guard, so this is a reserve type unit, it's not an active duty position, but anyway, he was arrested and charged Wednesday with one count of knowingly entering or remaining in any restricted building or grounds without lawful authority and one count of violent entry and disorderly conduct on Capitol grounds. So uh, the charging documents state that Fracker entered the U.S. Capitol on January 6th amid an attack by some supporters of President Trump, and he confirmed he participated via social media posts, of course, because they're all geniuses. Fracker is the first known service member to have been directly involved in the siege of the Capitol or charged in connection to it. Fracker is an infantryman who serves in a traditional part-time National Guard role. A spokesman for the Virginia Guard said he was not among some 1,000 Virginia Guard troops activated to support security operations ahead of Biden's January 20th inauguration, Fryer said. Let me repeat that last sentence because this is something that I spoke about before and this should just be shouted loudly so everybody could be aware of what potentially can happen here. It says he was not among the some 1,000 Virginia Guard troops activated to support security operations ahead of Biden's January 20th inauguration. That means that there are potential people that have been called up to support the inauguration. These are guardsmen that are called up to support the inauguration, that potentially were in that crowd, participating in that insurrection last Wednesday. And I've heard stories about internal investigations and all that stuff, but by the time that a sort of an investigation can root out all these evils that are standing shoulder to shoulder with other guardsmen that were just, you know, at home during their normal civilian duty. By the time that's rooted out, these people will already be. And mind you now, a lot of them now are armed. Usually guardsmen aren't necessarily armed. They're used for things like earthquake relief or hurricane relief and situations like that. And maybe sometimes you'll have armed guardsmen that are activated because of riots and unrest. But generally, for the most part, they're not armed unless there's a special unit. And so now you have somebody like this, potentially, that is now armed officially in their official capacity as a arm as a guardsman behind those eight foot quote unquote unscalable gates that they put up in the Capitol. Well who needs to scale the gates when I'm already on the inside? So I'll move on to the next article here, but it all ties together till we get to our ending here. And so the next article is uh, was written by the uh, AP, and they, the, the headline says that all Capitol rioters included highly trained ex-military and cops. I read something a while ago contributing to the show, and what I mentioned was that I wanted to make everybody aware that, you know, there's racism in the military also. The crop of people that come into the military are picked from the general society. So if your general society has racists and white supremacists and extremists in the general society, if your recruiter isn't diligent enough to root those out, or if we're in a place like what happened with 9-11, where there's such a surge for recruitment, where you know what, you, you let your standards down a little bit, these people 
have infiltrated our military. They have infiltrated our reserve forces. They've come up in the ranks. They actually have become officers, not just enlisted. These are people in charge, these people with access, and they're using the things that they've learned. And again, with Afghanistan and Iraq being key practice grounds for them to take that back home with them and use those tactics, it's even more shameful and it's even more derelict of the oath that they took when they first joined. But let me let me continue with the article. We're going to get to that in a second. So as President Donald Trump supporters massed outside the Capitol last week and sang the national anthem, a line of men wearing olive drab helmets and body armor trugged purposefully up the marble stairs in a single file line, each man holding the jacket collar of the one ahead. David, I hope you can, I hope you see the picture that's included in this article and I hope you can share it. It, it is eerie. It is wild to know that. And it's a throng of people and you just have this single file line of these guys in their, you know, their, their wannabe uh, military unit. And they're, they're preparing to siege this building like very professional like. And everybody else around them is, is, I don't know if they're none the wiser, but they, you know, they're, they're just, they blend right in. And this one guy here is filming it like he's amazed at the precision of this. But this is stuff that, that they learned in the military. They learned in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And they're using it now against our own country. Talk about our oath says foreign and domestic. And you've become that person. You are the domestic. We we took an oath to protect the nation and the constitution against enemies foreign and domestic. And here you are, you are that you're using that, these very same tactics to lay siege uh, with all kinds of ill intent on our capital uh, in, in broad daylight and everybody can see you. It's all recorded. L- l- let me continue. The formation known as Ranger File is standard operating procedure for a combat team that is stacking up to breach a building. Instantly recognizable to any U.S. soldier or Marine who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was a chilling sign that many at the vanguard of the mob that stormed the seat of American democracy either had military training or were trained by those who did. An Associated Press preview of public records, social media posts, and videos show at least 21 current or former members of the U.S. military or law enforcement have been identified as being at or near the Capitol riot, with more than a dozen others under investigation but not yet named. In many cases, those who stormed the Capitol appear to employ tactics, body armor, and technology, such as two-way radio headsets that were similar to those of the very police they were confronting. Guess blue lives doesn't matter after all. Experts in homegrown extremism have warned for years about efforts by far-right militants and white supremacist groups to radicalize and recruit people in military and law enforcement training. And they say that the January 6th insurrection that left five people dead saw some of their worst fears realized. Here's a quote. Prescient. ISIS and Al-Qaeda would drool over having someone with the training and experience of a U.S. military officer, said Michael German. Of uh, He's a former FBI agent and fellow with the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU. These people have training and capabilities that far exceed what any foreign terrorist group can do. Foreign terrorist groups don't have any members who have badges. And that's another thing. Some of these mother bleepers have badges. These people are actual uh, in their off time, we have one guy here, Jacob Fraker, from the very first article that I read. He's also charged with um, uh, his other accomplice, T.J. Uh, Robertson. They were arrested, like I mentioned. These these two are, they're actually policemen. Fraker is a corporal and an infantryman with the Virginia Army National Guard, while Robertson previously served as the Army, Re- Army Reserve. Uh, Fraker is the first active, again, I say he's the first one to be charged. But both men were photographed inside the building. And both men, where does it say here with their civilian jobs? I, I don't see exactly where it says it right here. I read it earlier, but both of these guys are police officers. Their police officer is not too far away from, from the Capitol. I think they live in Roanoke, which is not too far away from DC there. So these guys can A, not only flash their civilian badges when they're doing things like this, but they also have the tactics that they learn from the military. They have the gear. Again, part of militarizing our police. They can use gear like that, and it's already domestically available for these people to take advantage of in the most wrong ways. So here's, I, I bring all of this stuff up because of this final article here by Todd Smith, and you can find it in Military Times. 
And the title of this one is, Can the Pentagon Prosecute Military Retirees Under UCMJ? Maybe. It depends. I'm not going to read all of this, but I have my own conclusions on what I think should happen. So they go, um, recent reports of current service members, veteran, and some military retirees participating in the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th have prompted calls for investigations into those connections and using a, a uniform code of military justice, that's the UCMJ, to prosecute these offenders. But the law is complicated. Each of those groups fall into different categories when it comes to UCMJ and military justice might not apply in many cases. The trickiest is retirees. So for those currently serving on active duty, yes, the UCMJ applies. The UCMJ does not apply, though, to veterans who were discharged before reaching 20 years of service and qualifying for retirement. For reservists, and like this would be the same thing for like guardsmen, for reservists, the UCMJ applies only while on active duty. Like if you're on active duty orders, uh, for, you know, usually get on orders for maybe six months, three months, depending on what the activity you're supporting or even a year. So it would officially make you active duty for that time period, even though you're technically a reservist or um, a guardsman. Uh, so the UCMJ applies only while on active duty or inactive duty training. Uh, and active duty training would be when you're doing, for example, your reserve activity. So if you have drill uh, for that weekend or if, you, um, if you're doing your annual training for like a two-week period, you're kind of considered active duty. And so you fall under the UCMJ like any other active duty person would. But for retirees, the UCMJ does not apply in some situations. It all depends on how they retired, and even that is being litigated. In a letter to Acting Secretary of Defense Chris Miller this week, combat veteran and U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth of uh, Illinois called for the Pentagon and services to root out extremists and hold individuals accountable under the UCMJ. Okay, there's a lot more to this article, but I'm not going to go into all of that because I have a conclusion. Yes, hold them accountable. At very least, what you can do is if you were caught, if you are caught as part of this insurrection, you have broken all the oaths you've ever taken. And I don't care how how much admirable service you've had in the entire 19 years, you messed up this one time. That's good enough for me to disavow you from the military and all the benefits thereof. And so my solution would be just that. Okay, so when you retire when you, or when you disassociate with the military in good standing, honorable discharge, that would be, you still have certain benefits. You can go on base. You get, you can apply for VA loan, which is different standards and it, it provides a guarantee of a certain amount of that loan that, you know, civilians aren't privy to. You get, uh, you might even be entitled to some, some form of a pension, depending on how long you serve, depending on how much you contributed to your, your TSP. Uh, you have access to TRICARE. TRICARE is a sort of like um, a public option almost for for military members uh, when it comes to health insurance. Uh, you, again, you can go on base and on base you can shop at the commissary and the exchange. These are places you get va uh, vast discounts um, in comparison to stuff in the civilian world. You can even get burial rights. You get a burial plot which can cost thousands of dollars for people, but you get this for free through the military, depending on what state you're in. You can get, uh, they have the, the burial site there that you get the military or the, the federal site that you can get buried at. You can even get buried at sea if you want. And the, and the military would pay for all of this. It's part of your military veterans. I say take all of that stuff away. Your educational benefits, if you serve for over, I think, two years, you get either discount, they'll, they'll pay like 50% of some schooling that you do, or depending on how many, if you serve more years, they can end up paying for all of your, your degree, with a bachelor's or even a master's degree. Take all that away. Your medical benefits, the home loan stuff, the pension, uh, take, you get hiring preference when you go on USA jobs to, uh, uh, to apply. You get actual points added to your application because you're a veteran. Take all that stuff away. So even if you can't give them the, the, the highest penalties under UCMJ, which can involve prison time and, of course, dishonorable discharge. And maybe they've already been discharged honorably, so you, you probably can't go back and do that. But take away the benefits. They can no longer associate with the country that they swore an oath to protect. They are now the Confederates. These are the same people that are military veterans who fly Confederate flags in the back of the truck. You are flying the flag of Trump and the flying the flag of the Confederacy at the Capitol you are flying the flag of the enemy. You're flying the flag of the, the side that lost. Trump's side lost. 
and Trump officially staked his claim as the enemy of the United States. He did not like democracy because apparently democracy voted him out and he didn't like that. So basically you don't like democracy. So fine. You find yourself in the opposition. You can go and we will keep our benefits with us. So that's my conclusion. I know I went a little bit longer than usual, but this is disgraceful um, that they can, somebody can serve all these years, put in all that time and just throw it all away, throw it all away in one stupid, ill-advised, emotional outburst like this that puts people's lives in danger. And it could have been so much worse. These people had tactical gear. These people had um, war zone type tactics that they employed. They were intent on doing far worse. We got lucky that what happened on January 6th was all that happened on January 6th. Unfortunately, a, you know, half a dozen people died and there may be some other things that fall out from this, but it could have been so much worse. They were prepared to do so much worse. Even if they weren't prepared to do the worst, they were prepared if the worst happened. They were going to go there. They were going to go there, all the way there. And so I say F them all, um, and they can all... Uh, uh, I, I would charge him with treason. And we know what the we know what the highest penalty of treason is. That's what I would do. But again, that's why you don't put someone like me in charge, um, because uh, I can tend to be so uh, pretty black and white with a lot of these things. Anyways, that's my take uh, from somebody that's um, actually subject to the UCMJ, um, and I, I, I hope I, I was able to shed some light into some of the you know behind the curtain on how, how that works in the military. And um, we'll stand by and, and, and see what all the fallout of this is. But one thing I will warn is that um, the inauguration day, there may be people in those ranks behind that gate that are already sympathizers to this cause, to this movement. That's it for me today. Thanks for um, allowing me to share this, David. Stay safe. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Darwin. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, a little uh, extra leeway on the the length of the the piece today because uh, not only of the importance and relevance uh, of, of of what you brought up but the personal perspective and i appreciate that uh, one that you took the time to do it and i appreciate the uh the the i guess we'll call it i mean i don't want to downplay it anyway but the emotion that you you brought to it too it's uh, it's got to be particularly disturbing on a number of levels not just because you yourself are as you mentioned subject to ucmj but you know, uh, you're going to feel betrayed on multiple levels here. Uh, one, that people who are uh, like you or subject to UCMJ or people who might be able to escape the uh, uh, harsher penalties of the UCMJ and the different procedure and the various other penalties that they can face <clears throat> in terms of loss of benefits to the fact that if they don't face this they continue to enjoy the same benefits that those of you who have actually served honorably are able to enjoy. And then I guess also a, th a third and, and, and more, I'm sure I'm leaving some other ones out, but the idea that some of them, if they are not full-time active duty, are also in civilian jobs in which they would exercise authority over others and without... Uh, getting too far into the other discussion we've we've had this discussion for uh pretty much like well the entirety of uh the existence of the show and well before uh but but you can all put it together in your heads the the um uh the mixture of uh authority under color of law being handed over to people who have extremist views and that those extremist views at their worst, and it doesn't even really have to be at their worst, but that they may be behind one only the insurrection. But who did we originally suspect right from the beginning was involved in all this? The most extremist elements that would include white supremacists and, you know, uh, uh, various other authoritarians, Nazis and, and wannabe dictators. But it mixes up. Uh, well, it's it's a perfect mix, unfortunately, along with the ongoing problem we have with policing here in America and how they execute that job and against whom they tend to exercise abusive levels of their authority. And uh, what, a, what a mix. What a strange and heady brew that is to then bring it all inside Washington, D.C. 
and say, let's let them guard the security of the transition, the peaceful transition to the uh, Joe Biden presidency could cause, uh, well, a number of issues. And I don't know. I, I, I mean, it may be clamped down on quickly enough. And as a matter of fact, by the way, I guess I'll at least uh, mention this too, and I'll dig up this tweet for you over the break and include it in the roundup. Uh, at least some journalists apparently approaching this thing already with the idea that, well, you know, if nothing ends up happening, and all this, well, thank God, it will have saved the republic at that point, but if nothing ends up happening, well, this is going to look like a lot of panic over nothing, which was unbelievable. And by the way, exactly how we effed up the pandemic that we're still stuck in. No one's learned a thing. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kid Growing the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Man, all right, lots to catch up on and not enough to uh, get in. Oh, all right, well, not enough time to get on to all of it. Let's see, just got to take this uh, Got to take this phone call here. Let's see, uh, what do we got here? Here's a uh, tweet that has made it through uh, as uh, breaking news uh, dated. Uh, okay, yeah, so it's recent. It is from 1021 this morning, the dispatch from Jackson Prosco, Prosco, uh, Washington Bureau Chief for Canada's Global News and Global National. Thank you, Canada. Hi, Canadians. Uh, Canadians breaking this news. I guess smoke rising behind Capitol building. Inauguration rehearsal appears to be evacuating. Emergency announcement playing at Capitol grounds. The smoke has now subsided. He tweets uh, a minute later. There's some video involved here, and I mean, I guess we'll see smoke. I don't know if we really want to pause to look at but maybe I wonder if there's audio of the emergency uh, announcement. People who were on the grounds for inauguration rehearsal have left. Capitol buildings on lockdown, according to the tweet embedded here from uh, Weija Jiang, who is CBS News. I hope I pronounced her name correctly. And I, if I watched enough CBS News, I'd know it already. Uh, senior White House correspondent for CBS News who probably doesn't call her own name out every time she's doing it, but, you know, the anchors will say, and now here is, all right, anyway, to report new at 10.20 a.m. This is all about 10 minutes ago, if you're listening to the podcast later on. Hill staffers received the following text per uh, Arden Far Farhi, Arden, the CBS News correspondent, White House correspondent and producer, um, the text saying, all buildings within the Capitol complex, external security threat. No, uh, it's colon, external security threat. No entry or exit is permitted. Stay away from exterior windows, doors. If outside, I'm sure it means seek cover is a typo in here, seam cover. And signed U.S. Capitol Police, U.S.C.P. Uh, lots of people rightly worried and panicking about this. And I don't know the uh, background of this one because i never did get around to reading or watching the handmaid's tale but somebody's saying this is how the handmaid's tale started i don't know what to tell you uh let's see anything more in uh nothing more from jackson anything more from wagia uh i hope i'm pronouncing that right wagia wagia i wish i knew i don't watch enough no uh everybody's in the dark let's see what does this uh raise the volume on this ill-advised to do this on the laptop but uh, i want to Look at this video here, see if there's any. Yeah, you can hear this. Shh. Everyone's running from the Capitol grounds. Yeah, you probably can't hear this all that well. 
Let me, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's off in the distance anyway in the recording, but that only just makes it that much eerier. And that's a weird sound that I have never really heard before. But, uh, you know, these days, I don't know what the security is like down there on Capitol Hill and what the alerts, whatever. I don't think we ever heard any alert quite like this one. But let me, uh, I don't know. Let's see if we can bring it up on the big computer just so you can get some sense of what we're talking about. Not that I have any, and no one at this point has any uh, immediate understanding of exactly what this situation is about. But let me, yeah, this at least this way I can play the video for you in a setting that you can hear it. I can pump up the volume a little bit if necessary. Here we go. <laughs> Everyone's running from the Capitol grounds. Yeah, I don't know even what that is all about. You can barely make out what that... Uh, Announcement ends up being, but that's kind of scary. Due to, I mean, you hear the echoing outside, due to an external, uh, okay, security threat. That could be anything. It could be nothing. The smoke uh, in the video is rising from the east side of the Capitol, whereas the risers uh, that are set up for inauguration are on the west side of the Capitol. So it's not in the immediate vicinity of the assembly for the rehearsal but you don't want smoke rising anywhere near the capitol building at this point uh so hopefully everything is okay we will see what we can learn and really by the time we figure these things out we'll be off the air and uh those of you listening live will have a better idea perhaps what's going on right now than we do but i guess i gotta bring that up and worry about that now um hmm. anyway uh wow uh where to jump next after a piece of news like that i don't know let's uh I'm just keep keep the twitter page open so that we can see what else is going on um let's see uh the uh update on riley williams um as i mentioned karen had sent this tweet from mike singleton who is uh, a senior executive at nbc it says yeah a retired nbc person and so just i guess you know, a, a blue check type person, but uh, not necessarily in a position to know. Uh, his tweet started off saying that Riley Williams was arrested. I have since seen others uh, correcting us and saying, no, uh, not arrested. She has, in fact, fled just as the articles that Greg shared with us had said. A um, couple other pieces out there about how weird it is that she was uh, how did she make this connection, trying to sell this thing to a friend in Russia who was then going to pass it on to the Russian intelligence agencies or whatever? Um, I don't know whether this is an ad hoc deal, like, look what I found. Let's see if I can make some money out of it or whether that's what she was sent there for. Investigation in the days to come will probably reveal some theories about that one. And uh, I don't know what else to say um, about that. Uh, another article i guess sent my way about this let's see uh, what's this one telling me uh oh, somebody apparently says that uh, they have video of riley williams fleeing the capitol with pelosi's laptop slash hard drive i'm going to have to take a look at this uh what kind of video have we got here and how much of it oh, wow Oops. Very loud. okay I might want to turn the volume down on that one because I don't think the sound is going to tell us anything. But there she is in her highly recognizable brown coat and wearing a mask, by the way, just in case you thought she was an anti-masker. And she's uh, making her way down. I don't know if it's the if I, I wouldn't say that the laptop and and or hard drive are clearly visible in the video, but she's got a large bag, zebra striped, you know, bag or purse or what have you. And, uh, you know, anything could be in that, but that's definitely her. Looks like her and she's got the coat and who knows. All right. Well, that's out there now. Uh, but I have to figure that the case is pretty well developed, uh, on that now. Uh, let's see. Is this, uh, 
what's going on. Possible source of the smoke being discussed out there uh, may have been a homeless person's belongings that went up in flames under the, it says the 695 bridge near H and 2nd Streets southeast. Extremely unfortunate, but may have been the source of the smoke. So I don't know. That could be good. Could I mean, in terms better than like, say, a bomb, for instance. Uh, Ricky it tells us all the way from uh, up in PEI. Good morning, PEI. How you doing? This is how The Handmaid's Tale started. The right wing religious zealots who run. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with the story to be able to Diliad. Is that how they? Somebody who read it can tell me. Hey, well, Ricky read it. Anyway, they bombed the Capitol building and the White House, killing the majority of the government. Okay. Well, a lot of things start that way. A lot of books. Uh, but uh, all right. You know, I'll take your word for it. And it means something to lots of people and uh, is perhaps uh, directly on point as well. So thanks for bringing us up to speed on that one. Uh, all right. Yeah. It's getting pretty crazy out there. All right. Let's see. What else can we get off of this immediate breaking news track now that we have word that the smoke might not be such a big uh, problem after all, but it's worrisome. Uh, let's see, man, you really should be reading the Axios uh, now four part series on just how stupid and crazy things are getting inside the white house or already have been outside the white house. I got to talk to Armando at some point in the next couple of days, because he is on a tear talking about Jonathan Turley and his latest uh, dishonest misadventures in pretending that, you know, that there's established authority for uh, prohibiting the uh, impeachment of former officials. We've been over that ad nauseum, and I think we spent far too much time on it, as always. But uh, we'll try and do it in more organized fashion going forward. I want to talk to Armando about it at some point because he's latched on to something in particular that seems important is that apparently Turley now, I don't know whether he disavows the thing or is just trying to play, you know, Mitt Rom the etch a sketch or what, but in 1999, for whatever reason, he apparently uh, was busy in, busying himself arguing the opposite position that in fact, former member, uh, former uh, federal officials were in fact, subject to impeachment. Eh, people change their minds about these things all the time. It does happen. As a matter of fact, I started uh, my own watch. I, I think we've mentioned this in the past, but uh, now long forgotten. I started my own uh, close eye, keeping a close eye on the development of the nuclear option and changing the rules of the Senate as an opponent of exercising the option because, of course, we were talking in 2004, 2005 about Republicans trying to force through their own judicial nominees and being blocked by the filibusters of Democrats, exercised by Democrats, and that they started discussing, well, we have this new thing where we're going to just get rid of the filibuster and steamroller you. And my initial reaction to it was, well, wait a second. You can't just get rid of that. That's, you know, that's a, a big deal. And in Senate rules and Senate lore. And this, this is well, this is before I actually, you know, did some, some reading and some study on the thing. My just, my initial reaction, this sounds like it sucks. Everybody's been saying since forever that you just can't go ahead and do this. And that it takes a two thirds vote to change the rules of the Senate. So I read the argument and I read the um, uh, law review articles that developed the argument and based it in history and traced it back. And I said, oh, well, the bad news is this can actually work. We need to do the best we can to fight against it during the next couple of months while the threat's still pending. But then afterwards, once the threat had uh, uh, been disarmed or disarmed itself through the actions of the Gang of 14, you all remember the settlement that they came to, to avoid the exercise of the nuclear option. But that gave us a breather and a moment to study up on exactly what was it that they were talking about, at which point it became clear to me that, well, if you had uh, made this argument to me at the time and I was able to stop and consider it, I would have said, oh, uh, unfortunate as it is, I believe you have a good argument here. This is uh, you know, what you're supposed to say, do as a federal judge. You say, well, you know, I didn't think I agreed with you at the outset, but having seen your authority laid out, 
I think I have come to understand what you're talking about. And thankfully, the ex- option wasn't exercised at that point, but I now see that it's in fact quite valid. And then when the shoe was on the other foot, I said, well, it's not so much that I'm changing my position on the wisdom of its use. Although I guess, you know, at bottom, you have to say that is exactly what happened. Uh, though the situation was a different one, but I said, yeah, well, what I learned in watching them in 2004 and 2005 was that they had some fairly stable legal grounds upon which to make this argument, having read and absorbed it and the threat having, uh, subsided in 2005, I will tell you this, these guys left behind some breadcrumbs that you could absolutely use to change, if not the rules, then certainly the precedents surrounding the use of the filibuster. And, and you might need to do it. And you might need to do it on everything, not just judicial nominations. And from that point, that's where that's where this whole thing started. How, people asked, uh, how did you become an expert in Senate rules? And now people go around and say things like, I'm an expert in Senate rules, and, and I am not. Uh, I don't think that's the way I would hold myself out. But I will say this, I became... Uh, much more adept in the Senate rules. I worked, uh, when I worked on the Hill, on the House side. I was a lot clearer on House rules and at least standard House floor procedures and how to, you know, how things worked and how the procedure worked and how it built on itself and attempted to legitimize each step with, you know, public record, public votes, and that nothing actually happens without the tacit, at least the tacit approval of whatever body is moving it forward, whether it's a single member of Congress or a committee or then the full body of the House and then both, and then, you know, bicameralism and then on to the, to the White House, etc. So, you know, I learned the system that way from the House side. I learned Senate rules by necessity in studying what was going on with the showdown over the judges and the threat of the nuclear option. And my, I guess my understanding of how procedure works on the House side made it easier to understand how procedure worked on the Senate side, even though it is very different in many other ways. And then from then on, it was just a matter of, well, I, I, I when a crisis arises, I read the rules and I interpret the rules. And, I, and some people just don't have that background or skill or interest or whatever. And and then from there, it sort of became, well, they're able to answer all these questions, this person. So they must be an expert in Senate rules. And what it is, is I guess being a, a, a an adept, being adept at understanding how rules work, how they're intended to work, how they've developed historically and what the language and lingo means to the various people involved and how these things have been interpreted in the past and therefore how they're likely to be interpreted in the future. And and that's it. That's how you make yourself, I guess, into somebody that at least appears to be, uh, if not an expert, then someone who you could at least say, hey, read this rule for me, maybe for the very first time and tell me what it means. Um, And it's not all just reading the rule on its face and saying what it means. It's also knowing where all the precedents and commentary on the interpretation of all those rules reside. They're not in the books you get in eighth grade civics and they're not in the Constitution and they're not in the House rules. They're in the precedents and they're harder to understand, parse, find and peruse. But, you know, I learned my way around them then. So there's the answer to a question no one was really asking explicitly, but uh, probably was lingering in the back of your mind. Uh, by the way, it also means that if you're actually uh, reasonably uh, good with reading comprehension and have some background, at least in some kind of procedure, and now you all do, and maybe some legal training, you can do it too. It's not, I don't think, any kind of unique, uh, you know, uh, a gift from God or savant type situation. I think you could, well, you know, that might explain a lot of other things, the, the idiot part anyway, um, uh, of the construction. But uh, I think you could all probably get this adept. And I'm going to force it on you by listening to the show. All right. Um, on to other areas. Uh, let's see. Oh, yes, right. I had mentioned to you. Uh, now I have found the official source of it. It was Peter Baker of the New York Times tweeting uh, in support of his story yesterday. As a candidate, Trump said he could eliminate the entire national debt. 
So there it is, debt, as Baker calls it out, as president. And really for it to have risen in the number that I had in my head here, it had to be the debt rather than the deficit. But he points out, instead of eliminating the entire national debt, which is huge, uh, in four years. Instead, it rose nearly $7.8 trillion on his watch, the third biggest increase relative to the size of the economy of any administration. Uh, according to this piece here in the Washington Post, so I guess I thought it was in support of his own piece in the Times, but it's not, just tipping his hat to the good work of other writers in another paper. Uh, the piece titled here, uh, Trump's most enduring legacy could be the historic rise in the national debt. Well, just one of many things that he promised and didn't come through on. Uh, in the last couple of days, my own list top of mind has been, of course, uh, one, the delivery of free Regeneron therapy to all seniors in the country for free. That hasn't happened and isn't likely to happen, though I understand some steps have been taken. And it's important to acknowledge this because, of course, there might be members of the audience who are themselves at risk or who know others who are or, you know, if their parents may report to them the worst news you could get at the moment. I've I've come down with COVID and you wonder, how can I get, you know, my parents this treatment? And as it turns out, um, I don't know the exact root to it, but there are very definitely doses of Regeneron therapies available out there if you find the right medical providers. And it's usually not going to be necessarily your primary physician, a primary care physician, though they may be able to direct you to someone. But uh, research hospitals around the country, apparently the places to go, uh, university medical centers, teaching hospitals, etc. cetera. Uh, if you are specifically looking for one of those monoclonal uh, um, therapies, uh, uh, Regeneron and the other bioequivalents are apparently, uh, at least in, in limited uh, uh, quantities, actually available to you. And you're able to possibly get involved in one of those things. Uh, some of the studies still ongoing with all of this. But you know, the promise, of course, was every senior in America will get it and get it for free. Uh, but don't despair. It's not completely absent from the scene. You just got to know how to navigate your way through it anyway uh maybe some more development on, on the news front about that anyway this is one of the things that he has failed to bring by the way i was also reminded uh whatever happened to the big promise that he was going to send out to, he had negotiated a great great deal right of 200 dollar uh, uh uh um what cards like essentially gift cards uh re debit cards 200 dollars for use towards prescription drugs to be sent out to every senior in America as well. That was supposed to go out like just before the election to seal his election and, and to, to have the seniors thank him by coming out in droves to vote for him. It was going to be 100. Then they said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make it 200. And he wanted to have his name on it and his picture. And it was going to be the Trump card and all that. Yeah, well, that fell apart too, just like everything else being delivered in two weeks. I mean, really, what a garbage legacy aside from you know trying to overthrow the government and stealing all the money and uh, selling out to russia and trying to strong arm ukraine and trying to fabricate evidence against biden and i mean you can go on and on and on i just think it's particularly sick in the middle of this uh pandemic which, by the way, we're now over a death toll of 400,000 and have, in fact, exceeded the total number of American service personnel lost in four years of global conflict in World War II. We have now killed that number. And a lot of them were, in fact, probably veterans of World War II and some of the elderly, uh, most elderly among them. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, more people in less than a year than we lost in four years of global conflict on two fronts with two major aggressive uh, uh, imperial powers in four years. So in other words, I guess you could say we lost people to COVID four times at four times the rate that we lost them in World War II. Pretty amazing. And in the middle of all this, when seniors are the most vulnerable and all this, to promise them over and over again, free goodies, magic cures, $200 off their prescriptions, etc., and not to deliver on any of it is particularly sick. But then so is trying to overthrow the government and laughing about it and saying, uh -huh, aren't my lawyers crazy? 
I don't know what to tell you. Let's see. Pardons on the way as well. Uh, word is, uh, according to the New York Times, I think last night, that many as a hundred probably horrific pardons in the offing. We'll probably get news of those today or tomorrow and some great reporting on exactly what you feared was happening, that pardons were just explicitly for sale, not necessarily directly by Trump himself, but probably through a multi-level marketing scheme, basically is what we have here. Uh, and, 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 you know, the excuse will be that people lobby for pardons all the time. And yes, they probably do pay or or at least offer to pay uh, on some contingency basis, attorneys to lobby to seek pardons. The difference really being one, it's not quite so explicit that it's about the cash. Uh, two, that you are lobbying a formal uh, pardons office that has a formal pardons procedure that vets and screens all of the applications such that nothing nefarious is handed over intentionally to the president of the United States, though presidents sometimes offer pardons without that screening or over the objections of that screening, as has been the case in the past. And I'm sure you're all thinking about uh, Bill Clinton and Mark Rich, but there's not a lot of examples of that going around until you get to the Trump administration. And the problem here is Trump makes no use of that vetting process or vetting office at all and jumps right past them. And for People to be offering their services not because they are skilled attorneys who understand how to navigate the formal uh, screening process for pardons, but because they have direct access to the president and the president is personally loyal to or thought anyway to be personally loyal to them and will bypass that system to grant you the pardon you want, though you're not deserving, but have given me money is the big problem. And then, of course, we get to the question of has any of that money kicked back to the president or his organization? And the answer is almost certainly yes there. So we'll be investigating that, I'm sure, in the days to come. Uh, other news that we can squeeze in here? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, what's this? Is this uh, anything new on... Uh, ah, a resignation, a prominent-ish resignation from inside the uh, Lauren Boebert camp citing Boebert's role in the Trump-incited terrorist insurrection. Da, 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 you know all about it. Ben Goldley, communications director for Representative Lauren Boebert, has resigned. It's meaningful, but I don't know whether Goldley has any long-term association with her. He may have just been an old Washington hand picked up by Boebert on her way in in need of a new staff. That happens particularly at the beginning of service for brand new members. Uh, so, but it's, uh, worth noting at any rate, let's see, uh, other things to discuss. Okay. Can't shoehorn that one in, uh, anything else? Uh, oh yeah. Well, we'll, uh, throw this one in here too, I guess, since we're, it's been talked about, <clears throat> uh, I'll refer you to Steve Vladek for a fuller discussion about this one, but, uh, we'll just tip you off to this. Uh, his tweet from January 15th saying, thanks to the My Pillow guy, sigh, here is hopefully for the last forking time, he says, one more thread on the Insurrection Act, in case that's on your mind, and why there's neither a legal nor practical pathway by which Trump could use it, as uh, others are advocating for him to do, to somehow stay in power and or prevent Biden's inauguration on Wednesday. And let's start at the beginning. He says the Insurrection Act, just for clarity, is actually shorthand for a series of statutes dating back to 1792 that authorized the president to use the military for domestic law enforcement. And you'll find them today at 10 U.S. Code sections 251 through 255. Critically, invoking the Insurrection Act is not, as he asterisks here, not tantamount to invoking martial law. Uh, despite what the my pillow guy has to say about the thing, <clears throat> and uh, almost every invocation of the statute throughout history has been to supplement civilian law enforcement, not to supplant it. Most recently, during the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles, and that's because martial law isn't something that you invoke; it's a factual state of affairs in which there is no functioning civilian government. As the Supreme Court held in 1866, it can never be applied where the courts are open and their process unobstructed. 
So, even if Trump were to invoke the Insurrection Act, all that he could lawfully do under that statute is to order the military to enforce federal, and depending on the provision, state laws. It is not and has not ever been a mechanism for overriding those laws. And to those who might respond that Trump doesn't care about laws, fair enough, but the military does. Invoking the Insurrection Act is not unlawful per se, but using it to order the military to prevent Biden's inauguration or take steps to keep Trump in power clearly is. That's because the unambiguous text of Section 1 of the 20th Amendment provides that Trump's term does end at noon on Wednesday, even if there's tension between them, and there isn't, and a statute like the Insurrection Act, well, that act cannot override a constitutional provision. Trump can and may still attempt some pretty shady stuff between now and Wednesday. He might even manage to pull off some of it, like pardoning everyone who stormed the Capitol. Despicable conduct for which he should be sanctioned, but my pillow guys, not so secret notes, notwithstanding, nothing in the act provides that any legal or practical mechanism to do any of this. You have been listening to Kegro in the morning with David Waldman. All right, well, we'll have to be unpacking all of that during the rest of the week, both leading up to the inauguration and after it. Lots to do on that front. But now, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Justice Putnam to bring you up to date on uh, some of the other stories that are equally crazy that we just couldn't fit in there. Please do stay tuned. See you tomorrow.